Hello and God bless you. Well, today we're going to start a new series, a study of King David. I've been wanting to do this series for a while, but the Lord's kind of put it on the back burner, and now I believe the Lord's ready for me to bring this out. I don't know how long this series will be because I want to do the story of David justice, and the reason why is because we can learn a lot from the life of David. He was a man after God's own heart and we're going to see that through this series if you look at my sermon notes for what is the Bible about the Old Testament part 3 I believe it is we see an outline that kind of gives us a little bit of a look at the life of the King of David we know that King David was anointed three different times. He was anointed first in front of his brothers by Samuel there in Bethlehem at his home. Later on he was anointed in Hebron and then again in Jerusalem he was anointed a third time. So, I mean, if you want to look at that, our sermon notes there, you can kind of see some highlights of David. I want to try to do it some justice. I may go and try to just bring out some stuff that we read in Chronicles. Because if you see the difference between Chronicles and First and Second Samuel and First and Second Kings, First Chronicles kind of summarizes First and Second. Th um, Samuel because first and second Samuel is first about David you know after he gets called after Saul is king and Saul is ends up dying and then David ends up becoming king and that's kind of the story we see in first Samuel then in 2 Samuel, it starts talking about what David does as king. And there in 1 Chronicles, it kind of gives a summary of First and 2 Samuel. And then 2 Chronicles kind of covers what First and 2 Kings does, which is basically from King Solomon all the way till they were led into captivity 70 years later so we may try to stick to first chronicles a little bit and we may not I don't know just yet like I said I want to do his um, David's life justice because as I said you know he's a, someone that we can learn from because you know he's he was a flawed person who messed up, as we'll see in this series. But at the same time, he had faith in God and he would repent. And he would... He always had his eye on the Lord. He never... He never went away from God. And if you read the story of the kings, King Saul was an, a humble man who was faithful to God, but he got proud. Samuel, or uh, Solomon, excuse me, he ended up getting wives to different places and started doing things that were. that end up making it where God told him that he, that after his kingdom that the kingdom would be divided. But King David was one of the only kings who kept his heart on God. Now I apologize if my microphone's going in now. I noticed it was doing it last week. I may have to get a new microphone, I don't know, or maybe I just had it placed different. 
guess we'll find out when we do our live chat. You can let me know in the comments if the audio is going in and out. But at one o'clock, we will. One o'clock on August seventh. One o'clock p.m. at our chat that's in the description down below. If you join the live chat, we'll hear it together, and hopefully the audio won't be going in and out like it did last week. But we're going to do something a little different, and you might find it a little puzzling because we're doing a story, a study of King David. But for today, we're going to talk about before King David, and there's a reason for it. I just kind of want to set up the story of King David. And first, we're going in our before David. We're going into the story of the Israelites in the wilderness when Moses was alive. Moses talking to him, and there's a reason for it. And you probably think I'm being crazy, telling a study about King David, and we're and we're reading about Moses. And the children of Israel in the desert, but like I said, there's a there's a reason for it. You can see, because Moses taught the people that God was the great King who gave Israel the covenant. He became their God, and they became His people. And God loves His people, and He also expects them to obey Him because they love him so he gave them the rules of this covenant so that they would obey him and you know to love him is to obey him you know if we're we're not going to obey somebody if we don't love him so God's wanting your love and he's wanting you to obey what he has for you in your life whatever that may be that's between you and God if you don't feel like God's speaking to you about what he wants for you continue to pray to him read your Bible God will show you what he wants for your life and sometimes he will speak to you where you know it's him it won't be just a still small voice sometimes I think I was last week I told a story about where I was in the middle of prayer two different times within this last month where I'm praying to God and I'm talking and it's still small voices trying to get my attention but I just keep talking so that voice just kind of shouts out. And this wasn't like an audibly thing like where everybody you know out you know that was in what the earshot could have heard but it was loud enough that it made me stop talking now unfortunately it wasn't like I said a audible voice you know sometimes we would love to hear the audible voices of, you know to hear the audible voice of God to hear those what he wants for us but that's not the way the Lord communicates with us. He, lo he wants us to pray to Him and to read His Word. That's how He wants to talk to us. We see first that Moses gives a prophecy of a future king of Israel. We see that in Deuteronomy 28, 36 and 37. The Lord shall bring thee and thy king which thou shalt set over thee unto a nation which neither thou nor thy fathers have known and there shalt thou serve other gods wood and stone and thou shalt become an astonishment a proverb a by, and a byword among all the nations whether the Lord shall lead thee and see what this is showing us here is the Israelites because at the time when this was when Moses gave this they were about to go into the wilderness or into the promised land rather 
the men who had like the ones that who were cursed that God said you won't enter the promised land those people had died you know like the people who believed the evil report that uh, that the ten spies had given out of the twelve that said that they weren't powerful enough to possess the land that God was giving them only Joshua and Caleb said that we're able to do this because God's on our side so everybody from that generation except for Joshua and David or Joshua and David Joshua and Caleb I hope I didn't say David a second ago everybody from that generation except for Joshua and Caleb had died so these were the children these were the ones that were born in the wilderness who weren't who didn't leave Egypt these Israelites knew that their parents had been slaves in Egypt they knew that the Lord had saved them and he had given them the, the covenant soon they would go into their new country and if they did not obey God and his commandments the Lord would send them out of the country he would send them to in their king to a foreign country that would not be Egypt but a country that their ancestors did not know and we see that you know if we we think about the stories of first and second Samuel first and second Kings first and second Chronicles it talks about how they were sent into land they didn't know of the, the, the land of the Chaldeans their new masters would force them to worship these false gods that were made out of wood or stone and like I said years later all this happened just as Moses had said you know they the Israelites did have a king the king and the people all did what wasn't right to the Lord so the Lord sent them away now we're going to see from Deuteronomy 17 we're going to read 14 through 20 Moses gives rules for a future king rules of what this future king should do when thou art come into the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee and shall possess it and shall dwell therein and shall say I will set a king over me like all the other nations that are about me thou shalt in any wise set him king over thee whom the Lord thy God shall choose one from among thy brethren shall thou set king over thee thou mayest not set a stranger over thee which is not thy brother but he shall not multiply horses to himself nor cause the people to return to Egypt to the end that he should multiply horses for as much as the Lord hath said unto you ye shall henceforth return no more that way neither shall he multiply wives to himself that his heart turn not away neither shall he greatly multiply to himself silver and gold and it shall be when he sitteth upon the throne of his kingdom that he shall write him a copy of this law in a book out of which is before the priests the Levites and it shall be with him and he shall read it therein all the days of his life that he may learn to fear the Lord his God and keep all the words of the this law 
in these statutes to do them. That his heart be not lifted above his brethren, and that he turn not aside from the commandment to the right hand or to the left, to the end that he may prolong his days in his kingdom, he and his children in the midst of Israel. So as we see here, Moses was telling the Israelites that the Lord, when the Lord gives, brings them to the new country, they promised that they'll possess it. The Lord would be their God. He would be their ruler. There would be no need for a God. Because God would be, would be their God. He would supply everything they need. However, they, did, they wanted to be like everybody else. They wanted to be like other, other nations. They wanted a God to, or excuse me, they wanted a king to rule over them. They weren't satisfied with God being the one who's their king. So the people asked for a king and they obeyed the, the advice of Moses here as we've seen. He told them that the king must be an Israelite. He must, must be from their nation and not a foreigner. Moses said that the Lord must choose the person who will be king. The Lord will choose the king for them. The king of Israel must not be like the kings of other nations. And Moses gives three rules about the king of Israel and how he should be different from other kings. Every king wanted many horses. Many horses would show that he was rich and important. He'd also want to have a large army. A large army would need many horses. They did not use horses for agriculture or just travel. They had horses for war. The king of Israel must not tame many horses. He shall not need a large army if he trusts in the Lord God. Egypt was the main seller of horses. Which, you know, if you've seen like some movies about Egypt and stuff, it's a little unexpected to hear that Egypt is the main seller of horses because you always see people on camels and things like that on there you always you always see like the the pyramids in the background and people on camels but here the word says that Egypt was the main seller of horses and the Israelites must not go to Egypt they must not depend on Egypt they can't go back to Egypt because as it, we said, as the scene that what we were just read here, is God doesn't want them to go back that way again. It's like it's, God was basically telling them, you know, you were slaves in Egypt. Egypt was your past. You're done. Don't even go back there. Don't even tempt yourself. Just don't go back. The king of the nations usually had many wives. The king of Israel must not have many wives. And Moses may have been thinking about foreign wives. Because it's normal to ha have an agreement with other nations. That is a part of the agreement. They would give their wives to each other. However, the Israelites should not have an agreement like that. Because the agreement would take them away from God because as we see you go through reading Judges, 1st, 2nd Samuel, 1st, 2nd Kings when they make the agreement with these people or even in Joshua we see that with making agreements with people 
either you if you make agreements or marry somebody a lot of times they you'll, they'll, the people will start doing the ways of their spouse and they will worship these false gods that they do and they will take them away from the Lord the kings of the nation wanted to be wealthy they wanted to get as much silver and gold as they could the king of Israel must not desire to become wealthy his task is to rule over the Israelites his purpose was not get rich the desire for wealth would cause him to depend on his wealth it would cause him to turn away from God so as we see here when God's talking about the horses and wives and riches with the riches and the wives you know he's talking about how these things can entice you away from serving God because they can trick you into serving something else and you'll be you won't be loyal to God like you were and God delivered the Israelites as we've seen from Egypt and he didn't want them to go back that way anymore where they could possibly become slaves again or or just go back to the past you know they gotta put complete their complete trust in God when a man becomes king he must copy the book of the law he must keep that copy with him and he must read it often the king must obey all the laws that are in the book he must rule Israel by the standards of the book because ultimately he's ruling on behalf of God so God has to be his master he has to fear God and he must love God he must serve the Lord and only the Lord as the king respects the Lord he will learn to respect his people he must realize that he is no better than his people he would be there for the benefit of the people with this attitude the Lord would let him and his descendants rule over Israel for a long time and that was the promise that God had made with to David as we'll see later on is that God wanted to show his love towards David and, and he told him if you you and your descendants do just like the rules these say you know if you if you keep your eyes on me and not depart from keeping your eyes on me then you'll have someone sitting on your throne forever so now we're gonna get away from Moses and we're now we're gonna talk about Samuel and I apologize I will probably brutalize the names that we're going to read here but first we're going to 1st Samuel chapter 1 verse 2 then we'll skip on down and read 6 this this is about Hannah who was the mother of Samuel and this is talking about Samuel's father and it said he had two wives the name of the one was Hannah and the name of the other Penaniah I guess I'm not saying that name right hopefully I said it right and Penaniah had children but Hannah had no children now we're on to verse 6 we're going to read 6 through 20 
It's going to be a lot of verses, but we're going to be setting up the story about Samuel. So see, Sam, um, Samuel's mother, she was barren. And she couldn't have kids, as we've seen that in verse 2. And the wife who could have children liked to make fun of her about it. It says, and her adversary also provoked her, provoked her sore, for to make her fret, because the Lord had shut up her womb. And as he did so year by year, when she went up to the house of the Lord, so she provoked her, therefore she wept and did not eat. And I'm sorry if I mispronounce his name here. Then it says, Then Echaniah, her husband, to her. Then said Echaniah, her husband, to her, Hannah. Why weepest thou? And why eatest thou not? And why is thy heart grieved? Am I not better to thee than ten sons? So as we see here, this is kind of set up. Echaniah here. Hope I pronounced his name right. He had two wives. One wife had children. The other one didn't. Hannah was, was barren and didn't have children. She was mocked by her husband's other wife. And so it was... So she, you know, it was rough for her, Hannah. She just... Because in that in the Bible days, you know, for a woman to have children, it was kind of a a blessing for her and for the husband. You know, and for her to not have a child, it was like a disgrace to her. Like she already felt the disgrace that she wasn't able to give her husband children because descendants are an important part of who people were you know your name was important by the descendants you had so Hannah had probably already felt miserable as it was but then she had her husband's other wife constantly mocking her and making fun of her because she couldn't have kids. So Hannah's husband, as we see her verse 8, you know, because as we've seen there before, Hannah's so upset that she can't eat, eat or drink or anything. She's just constantly crying every time they go up to offer at the temple. Or I don't know the temple is still the tabernacle at the time so her husband's asking her why is she not eating why is she weeping so much and why is she sad and he says am I not good enough for you there we go on so Hannah rose up after they had eaten in Shiloh and after they had drunk now Eli the priest sat upon the seat by the post of the temple of the Lord. See, it calls a temple here, but we know that right now it's still the tabernacle. So he's probably sitting above on the post that holds up the tent at the doorway. And she was in bitterness of soul and prayed unto the Lord and wept sore. And she bowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if thou will indeed look on the affliction of thine handmaiden, and remember me, and not forget thine handmaiden, but will forgive, excuse me, but will give unto thine handmaiden a man child, then I will give him unto the Lord all the days of his life, and there shall no razor come upon his head. 
And it came to pass as she continued praying before the Lord that L.A. marked her mouth. Which means he was watching her. He seen her praying and crying, but she wasn't making a noise. So he's watching her. Just, and we'll see what it, why he's watching her here. Now Hannah, she spoke in her heart. Only her lips moved, but her voice was not heard. Therefore, El, Eli thought she was drunk. Thought she had been drunk, drunken. So, Eli thought she was drinking, like she was drunk, like she was just, you know how people, some people act when they're drunk. So he was watching her lips moving, but nothing coming out. But she was deep in prayer, as it says, she was speaking in her heart. And God will hear those prayers. And Eli said unto her, how long will thou be drunken? Put away thy wine from thee. And Hannah answered and said, No, my Lord, I am a woman of a sorrowful spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but have poured out my soul before the Lord. Count not thy handmaiden for a daughter of Bilalel, I guess you'd say that. For out of the abundance of my complaint and grief have I spoken hitherto. So see, she's defending herself, saying that she's not drunk, that she's pouring out her heart to God, and you know she's and she helped you know she's asking him. So please don't think I'm drunk. I'm. I have a real burden on my heart. That I'm trying to, that I'm giving to God. Then Eli answered and said, Go in peace, and the God of Israel grant thee thy petition that thou hast asked for him, asked of him, excuse me. And she said, Let thine handmaiden find grace in thy sight. So the woman went to her, went her way. And did eat, and her countenance was no more sad. So after she had just gave it all to God, we see that you know her countenance was changed. She she lightened her load of that burden when she gave it to God, which is what we need to do. You know, when we got something heavy like weighing on us, we need to just give it to God. Because you see, it wasn't her defending herself to Eli. It was that she just came and she just in complete surrender and submission just laid it at the feet of the Lord. Just laid her burdens down. And when she was done, she got up, she went home, and she, and she felt better. She was able to eat, and she went and sat. And she said, I, lay, I laid all my burdens at the Lord's feet. I'm trusting the Lord to do something in my life. And if, and, you know, she just, she she gave it to God and she didn't worry about it anymore. It was... I mean, and if... If you've done that before, then you know exactly what Hannah went through. If you haven't, today's the day. You don't have to be in church. Just... Complete, completely submit and... To, you know, to God and just... Lay it all out. Pray that... God just takes it or or whatever it is that you're needing just lay it out to God don't because see what, what her prayer was is she was asking God 
Lord, I'm the shame of my family because I can't have a child. So I'm asking you, Lord, to give me a, a child. And I promise that I will give him to you. And he will he will serve you all the all the days of his life. So she was so she was asking God, give me a son and I'll give him right back to you. So what she was basically doing was she was doing like we you know like we need to do. She was she felt all this pressure in this from just as her society in the, anyway. Because like I said, you you kind of felt you know they you probably looked down at if you weren't able to give your husband a child. And we kind of see that in today's society when someone when a couple is trying to have a baby and they can't the the man and woman will kind of question herself question the other is something wrong with my wife that she can't give me a child there's something wrong with my husband that he can't give me a baby you know whatever it is so she was that's what she was kind of facing is that something was wrong with her that she wasn't able to have a child and of course she had her husband's other wife there mocking her as well so she came asking God for a child and she just laid everything out all of her sorrows about it all of her her worries she just laid it out she said I'm going to trust you to do the right thing for me God so that's like I said so that's what we got to do we got to just put our complete trust in God not on what anybody else may say we just got to completely trust him just lay it all out just trust God just completely surrender to him just lay it all out lay your burdens at his feet and don't doubt in your mind that it won't happen don't go praying and going you know thinking well if you want to just say Lord this is all just completely empty your heart to him all your burdens just lay it there and just leave it there don't worry about the outcome just leave it there and go on about your day and just like her your countenance will change it says that she wasn't sad anymore and she's able to eat and they rose up in the morning early and worshiped before the Lord and returned and came to their house at Ramah and Echaniah knew Hannah his wife and the Lord remembered her wherefore it came to pass when the time was come about after Hannah had conceived that she bore a son and she called his name Samuel saying because I have asked him of the Lord so as we see there two verses later after we stopped in 18 she laid her heart out and just gave everything to God not not worrying about if is this is going to happen or is God going to deny it she just laid it all out and went home and that's what we got to do just take those burdens just lay them at God's feet don't have any any expectations of how God's going to work it out just lay it all out and say there you go God that's it this is all, everything that's in my heart everything that's troubling me there it is and just walk away and there was sin in the verse 19 that Hannah and her husband end up having sex and they can be, can, and Hannah conceived and at the time nine months after she conceived she had a son now we're going to skip on down to 26 we're going to read three verses we're going to 26 to 28 here in first Samuel chapter 1 and she said oh my lord as thy soul liveth my lord I am the woman that stood by thee here 
praying unto the Lord, and she's speaking to Eli here in the temple. And she's reminding him that she's the one that was just completely just giving her burdens to God and think he, she, he thought she was drunk. For this child I pray and prayed, and the Lord hath given me my petition, which I asked of him. Therefore also I have lent him to the Lord. As long as he liveth, he shall be lent to the Lord, and he worshiped the Lord there. So as we see what we skipped here in First Samuel is that she gave birth to the baby, and then when they went to go worship at the temple, or at the tabernacle rather again, Hannah didn't go up until the time when the baby was off solid food, was able to be left with God. So he ended up staying there with Eli at the temple. Now we're going to go on to chapter 3 of 1 Samuel. We're going to read 3 through 11. And there the lamp of God went out in the temple of God, the Lord, where the ark of God was, and Samuel was laid down asleep, to sleep. That the Lord called Samuel, and he answered, Here I am. And he ran unto Eli and said, Here I am, for thou calleth me. And he said, I call not. Lie down again. And he went and lay down. And the Lord called yet again, Samuel, Samuel. And, excuse me. And Samuel arose. And he went to Eli and he said, Here I am, for thou hast called me. And he answered, I called not my son. Lie down again. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, neither was the word of the Lord yet revealed unto him. And the Lord called Samuel again the third time, and he arose and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for thou didst call me. And Eli perceived that the Lord had called the child. Therefore Eli said unto Samuel, Go lie down, it shall be. If he call thee, thou shalt say, Speak, Lord, for thy servant heareth. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. And the Lord came and stood and called as at the other times, Samuel, Samuel. Then Samuel answered, Speak, for thy servant heareth. And the Lord said to Samuel, Behold, I will do a thing in Israel which both the ears of every one that heareth it shall tingle. So as we see here, Hannah had given Samuel to the Lord, and he was there in the tabernacle. Or at least in the quarters where the priests were. And the Lord calls to him. And... He thinks it's Eli, so he runs in there and because he, he's walking out of sleep, so he wants in there and says, "What do you want?" It's like I didn't call you. Yeah, you did. I heard heard you say Samuel. Says, it wasn't me. Go back to sleep. So it happens three different times, and the third time when Samuel woke up and went to Eli and said, "What do you want?" He's like he Eli realized that it was God trying to get Samuel's attention, so he says say here I am Lord I know that I can hear you so and as we've seen there Samuel hadn't known God yet God hadn't spoke to him like this before so this was a first for Samuel first time he'd heard from God you know God's telling him here that he's going to become a prophet and he's going to do things through Samuel. That Israel's never seen before.
Now we're going to go to 1 Samuel chapter 8. We're going to read 5 through 7. This is how Israel wants a king. And said unto him, Behold, thou art old, and thy sons walk not in the, thy ways. Now make us a king to judge us like all nations. And we've seen that earlier. The Israelites want to be like everybody else. They want to have a king of their very own. But the thing displeased Samuel when they said, Give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed unto the Lord. And the Lord said unto Samuel, Hearken unto the voice of the people and all that they say unto thee. For they have not rejected thee, but they have rejected me, that I should not reign over them. So see, the people, they came to Samuel and they asked him to give them a king. Samuel warned them that this is, that the, that they shouldn't have a king. He warned them not to have a king. And he told them what having a king would do. But they refused to listen. And as we see here, the end result of it was that the people refused to have God as their as their king that rolls over them. God tells him clearly here that the people didn't reject you, Samuel. They rejected me. And we know in Hosea 13, 10, 11 says it that God was their king. And we're going to see other verses that say that as well. But Hosea 13, 10 says I will be thy king whereas any other that may save thee in all thy cities and thy judges of whom thou sayest give me a king and priest princess excuse me I gave thee a king in my anger and I took him away in my wrath Deuteronomy 33 5 says and he was king in Jeshurun when the heads of the people and the tribes of Israel were gathered together so see here clearly in Moses time it's saying that God was king we see this again in Numbers 23 21 he hath not beheld the iniquity of Jacob neither hath he seen perverseness in Israel the Lord is his his God is with him and the shout of a king is among them so basically this is to send for the people to shout to the Lord as they would shout to it about a king being with them shout and celebrate that God is with them because he is their king now we're going to read a couple of scriptures from the book of Psalms that back up that God was king the Lord is king forever and ever the heathen are perished out of the land out of his land that's Psalm 10 16 we're going to Psalm 44 4 which says thou art my king O Lord O, o God command deliverance for Jacob and then Psalms 47 6 and 7 says sing praises to God sing praises sing praises unto the king our king sing praises for God is the king of all the earth sing ye praises with understanding So after the Israelites asked Samuel to get them a king because they want to be like the other nations, we see in 1 Samuel chapter 10 verse 1 that Saul is anointed king 
It says, Then Saul, Samuel took a vial of oil, and he poured it upon his head, and kissed him, and said, It is not because the Lord hath anointed thee to the captain over his inheritance. And now we're going to go skip on down. To verse 19 through 24 and we see how Saul becomes the first king of Israel and this is Samuel talking to the people and I like what he has to say here and you have this day rejected your God who himself served you out of all your adversaries saved you out of all your adversaries and your tribulations and you have said unto him Nay, but set a king over us. Now therefore present yourselves before the Lord by your tribes and by your thousands. And when Samuel had caused all the tribes of Israel to come near, the tribes of Benjamin was taken. When he had caused the tribe of Benjamin to come near by their families, the families of Mattery, was taken and Saul the son of Kish was taken and when they sought him they could not he could not be found therefore they inquired of the Lord further if the man should yet come thither and the Lord answered behold he hath hid himself among the staff and they ran and fetched him thence and when he stood among the people he was higher than any of the people from his shoulders and upwards. And Samuel said to all the people, See ye him whom the Lord hath chosen, that there is none like him among all the people. And all the people shouted and said, God save the king. So I like how Samuel started that, how he said, you rejected God and you wanted a king. Now I'm going to give you a king. Here he is. Now we're going to see how Saul disobeys God. We see this first in 1 Samuel 13, 8 through 14. And he tarried seven days according to the set time that Samuel had appointed. But Samuel came not to Gilgal, and the people were scattered from him. And Saul said, Bring hither a burnt offering to me, and a peace offering. And he offered the burnt offering. And it came to pass, as soon as he had made an end of the offering, the burnt offering, behold, Samuel came. And Saul went out to meet him, that he might salute him. And Samuel said, What hast thou done? And Saul said, Because I saw that the people were scattered from me, and that thou camest not within the days appointed, and that the Philistines gathered themselves together at Mishmash, Therefore I said, The Philistine will come down now upon me to Gilgal, and I have not made supplication unto the Lord. I forced myself therefore, and offered a burnt offering. And Samuel said to Saul, Thou hast done foolishly, thou hast not kept the commandment of the Lord thy God, which he commanded, you, commanded thee, for now will the Lord have established thy kingdom upon Israel forever. But now thy kingdom shall not continue. The Lord hath sought a man after his own heart. And the Lord hath commanded him to be captain over his people. Because thou hast kept, not kept, that which the Lord commanded thee. And now we're going to skip on to chapter 15. We're going to read two verses there. Starting in 1 Samuel 15, verse 3. Now go and smite Amalek, 
and utterly destroy all that they have, and spare them not, but slay both men and women, infant and suckling, ox and sheep, camel and ass. And this is a result of the fight with Amalek. But Saul and the people spared Agag and the best of the sheep and of the oxen and the fatling and the lambs and all that was good and would not utterly destroy them. But everything that was vile they were and refused that they dis utterly destroyed utterly. And now we're going to continue on for two more verses as we see that God takes away Saul's kingdom. Then came the word of the Lord unto Samuel, saying, It repenteth me that I have set Saul to be king, for he has turned back from following me, and hath not performed my commandments. And he grieved Samuel, and he cried unto the Lord all night. Now we'll skip on down and read three more verses. F chapter 15, 26 through 28. And Samuel said unto Saul, I will not return with thee, for thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, and the Lord hath rejected thee from being king over Israel. And Samuel turned about to go away, and he laid hold on the skirt of his mantle, and it rent. And Samuel said unto him, The Lord hath rent the kingdom of Israel from thee this day, and hath given it to a neighbor of thine. It is better that is better than thou. And see, this is a setup to King David, because as we've seen. Samuel, Saul, excuse me, was from the tribe of Benjamin. And King uh, and David was from the tribe of Judah. So as it says, this, God's taken away the kingdom and he's given it to his neighbor. And he says that he's better than, that he'll be better than him. And I think that whenever, as we'll see, when Saul makes the realization that David is going to be the next king, he probably thinks about that, that he is better. So he, you know, tries to do his best to make that not happen. But we'll see that later, hopefully next week. But like I said, I don't want to rush it. I want to do this serious justice but so this like I said this is just a setup I'm sorry if it was a little long I just wanted it probably will be a little bit of a long series just because different things to cover with um, King David's life you know I want to cover it right like I said, maybe we might stick to what it says in Chronicles, where it won't be as much. But maybe we won't. I don't know just yet. But what I do know is that, as we said, David is a good example for us because he is somebody who his heart was after God. Anyway, like I said, we didn't really talk about King David here. We just kind of set up the story. And basically from here, after Saul fails to destroy everything from the Amalekites that God told him to destroy, God had let him still become stay king until his death, but he wasn't with Saul anymore.
and we'll see how David is anointed king by Samuel in Bethlehem where he lives with his family anyway I pray you got something out of this if you did give God glory I hope you enjoy the series I, I, like I said I, I think that this the David story is fascinating because David is a flawed man like we all are you know David tries to do right but you know there's different things in his life that get in the way that kind of mess up his walk with God but the lesson to be learned from that what David does is he doesn't let that control his his, out, his outcome he still prays to God to forgive him you know he's still seeking the Lord he's not he kept us he he was someone who had their heart for God that's why he's a good example so I pray you got something out of it. if you did give God glory remember to always read the word for yourself don't take my word everybody else is for it just continue to pray to God get a daily prayer life I can't wait to see what the Lord has for us next week with it I pray we continue with it but if the Lord once we end it there, then that's what we're in it. But like I said, I don't know how long the series is going to be. I want to do 